Welcome back to Dispatch Faith. I'm your host, Michael Renault. Joining me this week is Bob Smetana. Bob is a national reporter for Religion News Service and is also the author of the 2022 book, Reorganize Religion, the Reshaping of the American Church and Why It Matters. He's based in Chicago now, but has spent time with the Tennessean in Nashville, Christianity Today, and has contributed to uh, outlets like the Washington Post and USA Today. Um, Bob, thanks so much for joining us. And um, I should say, since you're a Boston sports fan, congratulations, maybe not so much on the Dodgers winning the World Series <laughs> as the Yankees losing the World Series. It was, it was lovely. Especially, it's nice to see Mookie Betts, who I love, and who the Red Sox never should have let go, uh, get the game winning hit against the Yankees. Yeah, absolutely. And then Dave Roberts, like he's mm-hmm. he's got his own Red Sox allure from two thousand four, breaking the curse, all that stuff. Yeah, Dave Dave Roberts is like the he I think he's immortalized in Boston. There there's a new uh Netflix series about the comeback from twenty years ago that I've mm-hmm. been watching. It's great. But Dave Roberts basically saved the Red Sox. Yep, absolutely. Uh <laughs> and now he's got as a manager, so this is his ninth season, right? I think he's got <laughs> credentials to head toward the hall of fame from yep. i was reading some some stats about that this morning he's <laughs> he's kind of in rarefied air with two world series titles now and having as much success as he's had it in la yeah yeah no he's um, been there a couple well, times so yeah that's no, awesome yeah yeah well um bob uh, thanks thanks for taking the time to join us i i think i mean we can just jump right in we're recording this on thursday october 31st so we are five days away from you know, we, we've written stuff at the dispatch this week, basically telling people don't try to read the tea leaves. It's too close to call. Um, no matter how you slice it, it's uh, a very close election coming up in five days. Uh, as we approach, what are um, some stories you are watching with regards to the election and both in how things have kind of unfolded over the last really two years of an election since the midterms, but as we head to the home stretch, what have been some of the big religion stories you think have played a part in this election cycle? So, so one is the role that um, the swing states are playing, swing state religious voters, especially um, they get they don't get covered enough, but the white Catholics and white mainliners are extraordinarily important in this this election because of where they live, right? There's a lot of mainliners in. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, there aren't as many of the sort of uh, on the Trump side, the evangelical voters in those places. So, so that's one part of it. I think you're really right on the, how close it is. We were, I was up in Wisconsin yesterday at a kind of rally and <clears throat> of faith leaders. And the first person, right, this rally is beginning. Three guys in a truck come by with a Trump flag and they're flipping everybody off and vote Trump. And as the thing's ending, three guys in a pickup drive by with two American flags and a and a Harris Waltz, you know, uh, sign saying "Vote Harris." So that's where we are. We're just yeah. Uh, so there's that part. I think um, the fallout from the Madison Square Garden rally among Hispanic voters. My colleague Jack Jenkins has covered that. That has been a lot of fallout. Folks who would have been Trump voters are like, wait. Why are you doing this? Especially Hispanic voters. That's a big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> some of the Catholic questions are big. But I think really it's it's going to be turnout and the voters we don't pay attention to enough. Uh, the white Catholics, the white mainliners, black Protestants, and then Muslim voters in Michigan is the other one. What will Muslim yep. voters do because of the Israeli-Palestine war? Right. Do you think, I mean, so talking about the shift to the the importance of Catholics and mainliners, I mean, you kind of peg that to the fact that they're more prominent, maybe, I guess, in in these seven swing states that are really going to shape the election, decide where the election goes. Do you think that is the sort of dynamic that kind of has legs to it, to use a journalism term, that will continue for the long term? Or do you think this this is just such a a weird election, the way things have turned out, that this is more a blip on the radar? I think it's the long term. I think one of the things that this that we've seen over the last three elections, at least, is that um, among American religious groups, white Christian groups tend to vote Democrat. Vote, excuse me. White Christian groups vote Republican. Everybody else votes Democrat. So you see a religious split. You see if you're Jewish or you're Muslim or you're Black Protestant or you're Hispanic Catholic or you're unaffiliated, you're going to vote Democrat. So that split, I think, is is related to the bigger changes and the 
religious landscape. So that will have legs. <clears throat> and the big sword has legs, right? We've sorted ourselves into states. So I used to live in uh, just outside of Nashville. It's a very red state. So uh, where there are a lot of evangelicals. Now I live outside of Chicago. It's a little more blue, Catholic, um, some mainline folks, uh, more nuns. So those, so we have a lot of states that have decided which side they're on. Then you're going to have these six or seven states where it's a little more purple. They look like, uh, so America is both um, very divided and kind of split right down the middle. But we don't, it doesn't play out that way. So it's split down the middle between, say, for example, Republicans and, and Democrats. But not every place is split down the middle. We have very partisan mm -hmm. places, and then we have these few, few split down the middle states. So I think that's going to have legs, unless yeah. people move. Well, it's so it's interesting. I mean, you you've lived <clears throat> in different parts of the country. I mean, you're from New England originally. You mm -hmm. you spent time in, as you said, in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm in East Tennessee, so I'm in an even redder. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, more Republican <laughs> part of Tennessee than you are in near Nashville. Um which feels practically coastal and elite compared to some, <laughs> some parts of some parts of East Tennessee. Now you're in Chicago, I guess, how are you seeing different? I mean, there are different geographical areas, but within those geographical areas, there are, you know, different religious groups that are more mm -hmm. prominent, probably not the right word, but I, I think, you know what I mean? Like how, how, um, how are those different groups? I, I guess, how conscious of those differences uh, you know, spurred by geography, I guess, but are, are even those particular faith groups in each of those places? Like, do some of these voters in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin realize the part that they have to play and how their, you know, how their religious affiliation, how their religious theological beliefs are, are playing into some of these dynamics? Yeah, I think so. I think folks, especially, especially in Wisconsin, are aware they're in the middle of a battleground state. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And they're also aware that even more that their neighbors are going to disagree. So if you're in a place like Tennessee or in Massachusetts or even Chicago, you'll have a few neighbors who disagree with the, with the majority, but there's a majority party and a set of assumptions about what is, what America is like and what we should expect. What's the place of religion? That was a really thing moving to Nashville. You realize religion is part of everyday life. Yeah. It's still in schools. It's the first question people ask you is where do you go to church? Second one is, would you like to come to my church, right? That's not a question you have in Massachusetts or um, Il uh, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So I think those, just the way religion plays out in certain parts of the country, folks um, see, they have a, I, often, I often say that Americans live in two worlds, right? One is a very religion, one is a very Protestant, very evangelical, Christianity is a, a center of life, part of the world. Mm -hmm. And there's very close relationship, and, and religion is very active in the public square. And there's part of the country where, where um, there's no really dominant religious group. Everyone's the same size. And religion is one of the things we talk about, but it's not a driver of the public, um, public discourse. And those yep. two worlds collide, and each person thinks, no, no, you're, not, you're, not, you're breaking the norms. Well, mm -hmm. actually, there's two sets of norms, and that's the problem. The two sets of norms collide. Especially with the growth of social media, we it used to be you didn't see the way the norms differentiated till you went somewhere, right? You get yeah. in a car and you go down to Nashville, you're like, I'm in a different universe. You get in a car and you go to New York or Chicago, you're in a different universe. But you but you'd only see it if you were there. Now we can see it all the time. Yeah, no, that's a uh, that's a great <clears throat> point. I think of, I mean, I have friends and 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 family now in in Austin, Texas, and the way that they approach conversations about some of these issues, or just living in the last, um, it, I was gonna say living in the last nine years. I mean, these are evangelical yes. friends of mine, and at times those differences have been more pronounced than others. I feel like in this yeah. election cycle, you know, the evangelical divide that we went through eight years ago, not really as pronounced as, as it was eight years ago, people kind of made their peace with where they're going to be. But the way that they approach those issues is so different than the way, you know, other folks where I live in mm -hmm. Upper East Tennessee approach the issues. Do you, do you think those, that kind of firewall um, between, you know, this part of the country that views religion this way and this part of the country that views religion as, you know, kind of central to everything and the sun around which everything else revolves do you think that firewall has changed over the years in terms of uh, 
I mean, geographical boundaries, but even, I don't know, numerically, maybe? Um, that's a good question. So one of the things that we, we saw, I do think that people are more aware that the issues that were, um, that divide us are present in their town. So think about Tennessee. Um, so about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there was a lot of arguments about refugees and immigrants to Tennessee. Because yep. Tennessee had not seen much immigration and not many refugees. And so they were all of a sudden dealing with that. And as people moved south to get away from the higher prices in the north, they would run into this culture. So uh, one example is we had, when I was a Tennessean, we had a Jewish family move into rural, uh, suburban Nashville. Their kid goes to second grade, and the Gideons are there giving her a Bible, a Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. And the parents are like, what on the world are you doing? They end up mm -hmm. suing, and the rest of the town is like, no, this is just what we do. Like, so you can't, the, uh, the issues of transgender and LGBT have become issues that everyone has to deal with. So, so the geographic boundaries have broken down in that. The, the issues uh, that the whole country has seen have come to all, even the reddest places. Yeah. What, so kind of fast forwarding a little bit, um, game out for me, um, if you want to, just what do you think some of the biggest religion stories might be either in a, a second President Trump administration after this election or in a President Harris administration? And I guess it, it removes it a little bit from the election news cycle, yeah. things that things that bubble up are different when you're in the heat of an election. Um, but what, what do you think will be some of the issues that could come up in either of those scenarios? So one issue is going to be this continued decline of uh, organized religion. And really we were seeing this collapse of congregational life. So the average congregation in America used to be 20 years ago, it was 137 people is now 65. So those congregations, when you have 137 people, you could pay the bills, you can pay your pastor, you can do all the things that you need to do. Keep the doors open. When you have 65, and this is the median size. So <clears throat> when you're 65 and smaller, you don't have the resources to stay open. So that's going to be one problem. No matter who's president, mm -hmm. organized religion has problems. One big story I'm really watching is what happens with the post uh, Helene cleanup in North Carolina. So if you call 20 years ago, when Katrina hit uh, New Orleans, it stayed in the news for a long time, but almost every congregation in America sent people to New Orleans to help with the rebuild, which took years. Well, Helene, because it was so, the destruction was so, it's not in an urban area, but it was so widespread, so difficult. There's going to be years and years of cleanup. Will you have the ability, will congregations have the ability to send? And, and congregations play, religious volunteers play a huge role in the way we've set up disaster relief. So mm -hmm. will we have, where's that mass volunteer help out effort going to come from? That's going to be a huge story. I think the closing of congregations is going to be a huge story. The decline of domination is going to be a huge story. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter who's president, half the country is going to be unhappy. So how do those religious groups um, figure out if they can still get along? Right? That's what, the, yesterday, the, a lot of the conversation was, all right, we're going to have an election. Then what? Right. How do we make sure, you know, our congregations will be divided? Half of the people in our city will be unhappy. So what on earth do we do that? We can't. Uh, I think that's the big story is will people, will people dig deeper in partisan divides? Or they say, wait, this is not a productive or healthy way to, have to grow a society if we each thinks the other side is the Antichrist. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, just from... <laughs> reporting you've done and i mean you mentioned being at a rally um yesterday in wisconsin uh where do you kind of place the the odds on kind of getting out of the morass of this hyper partisan sort of idea that we have i mean so not to um not to keep plugging some of our own stuff jonah goldberg yesterday wrote a piece for us his his wednesday g file mm -hmm. and made made the point that um it's really not so much partisanship anymore because partisanship, there's an implication of actually talking about policies mm -hmm. and having debates over public policies. And anymore, it's a form of identity politics yeah. where I hate them because they hate me or I hate them because I think they hate me and I think they hate my people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering how kind of optimistic you are from your reporting experience, what you've seen, people you've talked to that 
that dynamic could shift toward the better after this election? That I don't know. It's a good question. I think this is the question where um, part of the things I wrote about in my book is that we're at an inflection point, right? We're really moving from what America used to be, which is mostly white, mostly Christian, mostly male dominated, very nuclear friendly, family centric, church is the center of life, to a different world, right? That's more multicultural, more secular, more pluralistic, more LGBT affirming. Um, more egalitarian. It's a it's a different world. Plus, we've had all the uncertainties about um, the economy, you know, the uncertainties of world politics. So, you know, people are. What we see in this election is a symptom of this underlying anxiety we have that that we're seeing this transformation from what America used to be to what it's going to be, and what America is going to be. Not everyone has disagreed on or decided that they like. So the question will be then, in this new America, are we all going to get along or yeah. not? Because there's a great term called affective polarization, which is what you described, which is basically emotion, polarization based on emotion. How do I feel about the out group, the mm-hmm. other group? Yeah. What, um, I'm a little bit hopeful. I had a conversation with my brother who's very Republican, um, and he was dismayed at the election because he felt like social media and other other factors were driving people to hate each other. Like he is very, very clear politics of what he thinks is right and wrong. But he mm-hmm. doesn't want to live in a world where he has to hate everybody. Mm-hmm. Which I was very I was very um very, very uh encouraged by that. There's I've also seen this new movie called Leap of Faith, which is made by Yo Yo Ma's son. Uh it's the guy folks who made the Mr. Rogers neighborhood made this movie where these 12 pastors met together for a year and they're all from different, you know, there. some of them are, are conservative, some are liberal, some are black, some are white, some are gay and some are straight, and they spend a year figuring out if they can get along, and they decide that getting along and living together through the differences is better than splitting apart. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hopeful for that, but this, this is the point that every, every religious group in America has to decide whether they want to be part of the um, building a, a community where we focus on the common good or we build a community where I focus on my good yeah. first. And that's the decision we have to make. And so really that the future really is going to be shaped by the decisions that congregations and regular people make. Do you, I'm curious, are, are there any particular you know, kind of positive, <clears throat> I mean, what you would call positive examples of this playing out it just again, the the reporting you've done on the ground, people you've talked to in real life. Yeah, I think I think that film is encouraging. I thought this this thing yesterday was encouraging, where it was it was a little more progressive group of pastors, but they're a group of uh, activists and clergy. But they're they were thinking, oh wait, we have to make sure that we are going to get along afterwards. We have to coexist. So there's a lot of that kind of conversation going. On. That's encouraging. I'm encouraging about. Um, some congregations that are being rebuilt, because that's the, the other thing. The congregational life, because it's declining, mm-hmm. comes with other problems. So I, I went, I remember I talked about disaster relief. Well, think of all the things that happen in, um, in the church buildings in your community, right? They're voting places. They host food, um, food pantries. They host shelters. They host AA meetings. They're mm-hmm. free space and their community assets that are disappearing in large numbers. So if those disappear, that's going to be problematic. So I think I've seen some efforts to rebuild some congregations that are interesting, which are based on basically, be you know, let's not worry about politics. Let's worry about how do we get along with our neighbors? How do we reach out to people? How do we connect with people? How do we build place-based community? Mm-hmm. So those kind of things are encouraging. It's we're still we're at this. Um, this not still Malcolm Gladwell. We are at a tipping point or a convergence yeah. of what what kind of country do we want to have, and and who no matter who is the president, right? And it, I mean, I, I, the seeds for this have been sown <clears throat> were sowed a long time ago. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, decades ago. It feels like mm-hmm. just in in some senses, it feels like in the last mm-hmm. decade, fifteen years, maybe it, some of these changes and the ways in which the dynamics have shifted. It felt like it was very, very steady, and all of a sudden it wasn't. Um, I think which kind of adds to the yeah. um, 
kind of adds to the bewilderment for some people. For some for some folks, it's a good thing. But for some people, they're still trying to get their arms wrapped around what in the world is actually happening and just oh, finding yeah. words to put to it all. It's it's this is a difficult time to be a reporter because you not only do we have a, a very complex, changing world. Not only do we have highly partisan folks, we have um, a whole disinformation industry. Like sowing distrust is a is a lucrative industry, right? So you want to know. I see someone's video on the, and then we have this mechanism for sharing things, right? Yeah. In social media, well, I read a story, I or I see a video. I don't know what, if that's true or not because I can AI fake it, right? I can AI fake the. Um, the recording. So when we see recordings, because of our polarization, we no longer see the same thing. Yep. We no longer the the whole Springfield cat eating thing. I, I saw someone posting this picture of what they said were cats on a grill, and it had wings and no tail. You're like, I don't know about cats that have wings, but the people who saw it were like, no, that's a cat. You're like, it's got it's a chicken. This is a yeah. chicken. But we can't even see the same things. Yeah. Here's a hopeful story. One of the most funny stories I heard recently is some uh, there's an Episcopal church up in New Hampshire. They were having a Episcopal church. Sometimes have these are small things, right? Have blessings of animals. Well, this Episcopal mm -hmm. church has a Haitian priest. So he starts out by saying, "Hi, welcome to worship. I'm Haitian. I'm not going to eat your cat. We're <laughs> glad they're here." Be to, to, to like. Um, not play into the polarization, but also have some good humor about it, right? So one yeah. way is to be like, this is terrible, and untrue things should be rejected. But this rejection was also, hey, I'm this is who I really am, and more mm -hmm. of that kind of thing is, help, is hopeful. Yeah. Um, I want to, I mean, we're talking about these shifts, and it, it's a lot of hurry up and wait, and then all of a sudden things shift quickly, you know, sort of that conversation. But you wrote a book two years ago, or published two years ago, rather, um, that gets at some of this and trying to uncover um, or illuminate, I guess, some of these dynamics playing out. What just what inspired you to try to take on a book like that and, and write about, you know, these particular issues? It, it To me, you know, again, speaking as a as a as a journalist as well, it feels like such a hard thing to get your arms wrapped around and try to put into perspective a, you know, kind of a generational shift in yeah. social attitudes and demographics and all these different dynamics. What made you want to write the book and take on a project like that? So there's kind of three things. One was I have a real appreciation for organized religion because, because of all the social good, it makes the world less terrible. Right. That's what I wanted to call the book, Making the World Less Awful, was to, to codify the way that religion can and does at its best, you know, it bridge divides. It provides these kind of social helps so people's lives don't fall apart. It's part of our social fabric that is disintegrating and no one's paying attention. We're just not. I mean, mm -hmm. even though we, we pay attention to theological divides, we pay attention to denominational, we don't pay attention to the the unsustainable model that a lot of congregations have. And what will happen? Some people think, well, organized religion goes away. That's great. We'll just have soul cycle. Sure. Soul cycle is great. You can have community, but if you break your leg, soul cycle is not going to help you. If your parents die, soul cycle is not going to help you. Not that there's soul cycle, right? There's this kind of, um, so that's one reason. A second is my, I, have a, I became a grandfather and um, kind of that was happening on the way, but I'm thinking, what kind of world is my granddaughter going to live in, right? Is she going to live in a world where people turn on each other or people where, where people work together when things go bad? The third is just to help people understand what's going on. It's easy to think, when you look at the troubles of organized religion, to say uh, it's because of uh, theology. It's because of music. It's mm -hmm. because of abuse. It's because of... Um, a number, you know, we had the bad pastors. Some of those things are true, but it's really because the world has changed. Yeah. And so it's, you know, you could say, my, why is my congregation, congregation declining? Well, we'll just blame the pastor. We'll get new music. We'll change our theology. You could do all those things, but it won't affect that the people don't trust institutions anymore, that people don't think they have to go to church anymore or go to worship. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have to go, you have to persuade people. Persuading people is a lot harder than 
welcoming people who already think they have to be there. That's just a huge mm-hmm. shift. Um, and so to help people understand it's not their fault. So the decline of American religion is not the fault of religious leaders or congregations. It's their problem that they're going to have to deal with. Sure. Yeah, no, that's an, inter- that's an interesting distinction. Um, it's not so much organized religion's fault necessarily as it is just the challenge that's kind of before yeah. them to, to have to deal I mean, with. There are all kinds of problems with organized religion. Like, But even if organized religion was perfect, it would still have big problems. Sure. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. Um, do you think – so I think the book published in August of 2022, 20, so more than two years ago now. Um, if you are writing it today, is there anything that you would change about the book, either because your own thinking or or, or understanding of a particular thing has changed or just because the reality on the ground has changed in 2024 from 2022 or 2021? No, a lot of things – it would be mostly the same book. I'd have newer stories, obviously. Um, I might have more data because there are data about why people leave congregations. So that could have been helpful but because we know a little bit more about why people mm-hmm. leave. But it would be mostly the same. I think it's just gotten – we're getting a little more of the answer that people like polarization more than they want to get along. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of that. Um, I think that's that's the one thing. So the book ends um, with a with a story – um, back when I started Tennessee in, in 2008, I started in 2007, 2008, February, there's a tornado and presidential election or presidential primary and a mosque burning all the same weekend, right? Yeah. So I go to the small town in Tennessee, uh, in Tennessee, which has been devastated by a tornado. And everyone's there, the Baptists, the Church of Christ, the atheists, the Jewish folks, they're all just help cleaning up. They're doing this. And I, I covered that story for months. Uh, it was the first my first exposure to the way that religion helps in disaster relief and the way that people mm-hmm. and people from New Orleans who had been helped by people from Tennessee came to rural Tennessee to help because they'd been helped by folks when Katrina hit. So there was yeah. passing on, right? This this really wonderful. So I go on a su- Sunday, write the Sunday story about all the goodwill that's going on. I'm driving back. And I uh, get a call from our night editor that the mosque in a small town has been burned down. So I got to drive all the way to the other side of Nashville, South Net, to Columbia, Tennessee, where there's a white power. We These neo-Nazis burned down this mosque. And it was it's always stuck to me that these are the kind of choices we have in the way that religion unites us and divides us. But we can, uh, and that, that mosque burning was part of a longer um movement that was really anti-Muslim in Southern Tennessee, very strong for a long time. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it was based on anxiety about who we are. So in, in anxious moments, we we either turn on each other or we work together. So yeah. there's this great um, proverb from Star Trek that only a fool fights in a burning house. And that's that, that theme has stuck with me, right? That our, we, our house is on fire. What do we do? Do we point out who's at fault or do we try to work together? But the appeal, if you if you want to see the appeal of, uh, say, Donald Trump, you have to, I think, understand how much anxiety there, there is about the changing world and how much it's easier when you have anxiety to have someone to blame, mm-hmm. right? And to say, I'm unhappy. So I think what Trump reveals is the deep anxiety, but also the that not everyone is on board with all the changes so much so that they want to throw up their hands in, in a candidate who doesn't quite fit what you think that Republicans would vote for in the past. Right. Sure. But I think these, these are, um, these are hard times If people are not freaked out. They're not paying attention. And so one thing that religious groups can do is to help people deal with anxiety and change and adapt. Uh, but they, if they do that, we're in better shape. So I'm optimistic on the, when I see people doing that. I'm mm-hmm. pessimistic when I see people from whatever religious group buying into the polarization because then there's their job is not to do that. Their job is to be is to bridge build and to build a community for everyone. And if they have given up on that, then we're all in trouble. So how do you I guess one of the recurring <clears throat> questions that comes up in, in these conversations is I mean, you have religious groups, and some of them have. I was having a conversation with a writer about this yesterday. Actually, you have religious groups that have, you know, 
sincerely held religious beliefs, mm -hmm. theological beliefs about certain issues. You mentioned earlier how the world is becoming more egalitarian. Yeah. It's becoming, um, you know, more, more this and more that. You know, religious groups, denominations, churches, yeah. what have you, have these sincerely held religious beliefs. They're, you know, what they believe about the nature of the, uh, uh, of mm -hmm. humans, the nature of a person, sexuality issues, things like that. They're sincerely held beliefs that go back into history. How, I guess, how would you, as you're describing all this, how can religious communities, faiths, whatever, or churches, whatever, hang on to those sincerely held kind of bedrock foundational beliefs about things like the human person or, or sexuality? But not be given over to um, some of the some of the partisanship or some of the um, kind of animosity because I I think some people would say like just by nature of holding on to this set of mm -hmm. values yeah. it's going to be divisive and it's going to kind of be its own wedge even though that's not necessarily what they're trying to do per se does that make sense Yeah no no these are we have profound differences over issues like sexuality over issues like um, what's the right policies to, to have on immigration. We've always sincerely held different opinions. Um, I think you can, one of the reasons I like this movie that I mentioned, Leap of Faith, was that these are folks who had sincerely held opinions, but also recognized each other as neighbors. So they're going to disagree. Like, we're going to have disagreement over these issues, and they're going to continue. And um, if you say that, if you hold whatever belief you are anathema, then that's that's gonna um, that makes it very difficult to build community. Like there are mm -hmm. things that people can work on that they agree on, that they're not gonna be in the same church. Like I think they're gonna be churches that my observation is they're gonna be churches that are LGBT affirming, for example, and the churches that aren't. And that's just the way it's gonna be for a long time. Yeah. The Catholic Church is not gonna change. But what is it going to be like on congregational level? What is it going to be like? Uh, even those folks can um, work together on other kinds of issues. That's the interesting thing. Uh, again, I the one thing that fascinates me about disaster relief, for example, is it's the one place where where the need is so big that what you think about whatever, right? That that nobody cares. So the Southern Baptists yeah. show up. They're going to somebody's house to take a tree off there. If it's a gay couple, they don't care. If they're, you know, liberal leaning, a group that's more progressive will come in. If there's a conservative family that needs help, they're going to give out food because people mm -hmm. need food, right? So there are some big rock things that that they know that people need help, and that 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 need over overwhelms things. We see this all the time where people volunteer together on all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, I think, are the ways that we get out of this is the where are the places that we can get along and then yeah. I, I think some people get upset about some of these first amendment cases that uh, even the Hobby Lobby case or whatever we have in America these kind of two things that collide we have this idea that there's uh, free exercise of religion and no state sponsored religion and they collide because all the time mm -hmm. but we have a mechanism for figuring out is something a legit is something a a need that can be accommodated or not, right? So a great example, this is a, this is a little bit far afield, is Amis driving horse and buggy, right? Most of us would say, wait, you can't have a horse and buggy on a highway because it's gonna be problematic. Amish folks say no, we have religion. Or or Amish there was a big lawsuit in Wisconsin recently over Amish needing smoke detectors. Hardwired hmm. smoke detectors. Hardwired smoke detectors, great idea. If you have no, if you don't have it, but it requires that you have, um, a, you're on the electrical grid. You're not on the electrical grid, and you're Amish. You can't have a hardwired smoke detector. There's we have courts and a well-adjusted system to mitigate these things. Yep. The courts say, okay, is this a legitimate belief? Is it one that can? Is this? Does the state have a legitimate interest? Okay, and how do we balance this? And they decide. But I think that we have to realize that there are ways that, that really, so on one side, religious combination is not, I don't want to do this. I get to do whatever I want. I want to mm -hmm. speed. I don't want to serve you because of the color of your skin or whatever. That's, you don't just get a free ride on this. But there, and we have a system to decide whether you get an accommodation and then we move on. I th I made this point when um, I was talking to my church 
<laughs> as part of a seminar on Christianity and, and government or yeah. politics uh, earlier this week. Um, all these questions about, you know, the First Amendment, religious liberty, accommodation laws, mm -hmm. that sort of a thing. <clears throat> Not to say that the courts are perfect, but by and large, the courts, I think, you know, David French has made this point uh, quite a bit over the years. The courts have done a pretty good job, I think, mm. of kind of sussing these things out. And our system by design, like the court is the venue through which yeah. we decide these things. I think there's this reflexive assumption that once it gets to court, that means that something's gone screwy below. And, yeah, yeah. you know, really, you're going to have people who have disagreements about these issues just by nature of of us being people. And so yeah. the, the courts are the designed venue through which we, we litigate these things. Yeah. And I think, I think it would one, one downside, this is as a religion reporter and observer, one downside of having, um, of the complexity in the first amendment, the, the establishment clause and the free exercise clauses, there are religious people who, there are lawyers who specialize in establishment clause and pretend the free exercise doesn't exist. There are mm -hmm. lawyers who, focus on free exercise and pretend establishment doesn't exist. And that that adversarial system, one way you raise money for that is to make your case in a way that appeals to the emotion. This is a, the, the, the difficult part of all this. To raise money, to get people to pay attention, you have to make an emotional appeal that it's us versus them. This is the, this affective polarization goes everywhere. It's always us versus them. Um, and Instead of saying, okay, these are two different sides of a um, of an important issue. So one issue I've been reporting on recently is the, um, what's called the Johnson Amendment, whether, about churches and whether you can, a, a preacher can endorse someone from the pulpit. It's a super interesting question because it has free exercise, free speech, and then um, not a taxable implications, right? Do you want nonprofits? to do this. Um, and it came up again recently because newspapers have become nonprofits. Some nonprofit newspapers still endorse candidates. Mm -hmm. So some church groups are like, oh, okay. Um, why can't we do this? That's a, that's a fair question. It's a fair question to ask. Is this a... Uh, and and the, the complicating is that is that almost anyone who goes to a religious house of worship does not want an endorsement, right? They don't want endorsements. So... It's not, um, this is a legitimate question probably should be litigated at some point. It may not be litigated because no one wants to tackle it, but it's not, sure. it's not wrong to say, I have a question about this policy. And I think we could go further. As a reporter, I see some of the, the litigation that goes on. It's always us versus them. Mm -hmm. so that's the bigger problem. That's the bigger issue we're all dealing with is this affective polarization that affects us. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, I put up a sign in my yard. It says, um, hate has no home here. These, these, these signs came up uh, a number of years ago during one of the big immigration debates. Some folks in Chicago made these, these signs. They put them up in their neighborhood. It was, uh, I had had one in Tennessee, and then I, I, it didn't survive our move up to Chicago. Then I, I started reading the sign. I, didn't put, I got a new one, and I didn't put it up. Because to say that hate has no home means that in my life, in my house, I will not hate other people, mm -hmm. even people who I've profoundly disagreed with. So even as a reporter, mm -hmm. I found myself thinking, oh, these people, there are people I disagree with that I want to hate. So if I want to put up a sign that says hate has no home, I have to uh, live that out and say, I'm not going to hate my political enemies or yeah. the religious groups that I think are wrong or the, the social groups, whoever it is, right? Um, and I'm a religious reporter, so I don't, I don't get in the right and wrong of religion. But you know, the actions of people, right? I, we can disagree over the actions and ideas of people without hating each other, and that's the real challenge right now. Um, it's a long answer to what you, but no, it's a hard it's time. A, it no, it is, and it's an. I mean, it's an insightful answer, and I feel like a lot of the. I mean, even conversations that I have with <laughs> folks, you know, regarding this issue or that issue. Um, even, I mean, in talking to, you've already brought this up, but talking to people about disaster relief after Helene, I mean, I, I wrote a, I wrote a story we published last week that got into some of this and I've had conversations with folks like Amanda Held Opelt, even in talking about something as kind of blatantly obvious and as simple as there's yeah. a natural disaster, people need help. 
certain organizations and groups are well equipped and well positioned to provide that help, you can escape some of these questions of polarization and, yeah. and these chasms that now exist because it just kind of pervades everything that we do, um, unfortunately. But um, I feel like there's probably six or seven questions I had on my list uh, yeah. to, to get to. Um, but we didn't, we didn't get to them all. So Bob, we'll, we'll have to continue the conversation yes, at some point, be but bef before I let you out of here, where can people follow you? Where can they find you? How can they keep up with the kinds of things so, you're doing? So, uh, you can find, find my stories at religionnews.com. I'm on Twitter at, at Bob Smetana. Um, I'm on Facebook too. I have Instagram, but it's Bob Smetana. I don't put anything on it because I have not figured out Instagram yet. So, but yeah, the religionnews.com, you can find our stories. We have a great story today called uh, We Tried Christian Nationalism in America, It Went Badly. It's about uh, established religion in the founding era, which is a lot, was a lot of fun to report on. But uh, religious, there was not much religious liberty if you were on the wrong side of the state church in early America, which is uh, yeah. helpful to understand. The, on, the, on the disaster relief, the funny thing about this whole thing is it's the one place where everyone gets along. Right. The government and churches they all work together. They all have their part. Secular groups, they they some do disaster, immediate cleanup, some do food, some do warehousing. It's a remarkably um, collaborative thing. I had the funniest conversation with um, Franklin Graham about this, who's very partisan, right? So Franklin Graham, head of Samaritan, he also runs a big charity organization called Samaritan's First. His the hurricane hit his town in Boone, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. He he said something interesting in the conversation because I was asking what the work they were doing. He said it was nice that no one was talking about the election on the ground. He's like, that's refreshing. I thought, oh, here's someone who is known in the public for his partisanship saying, oh, it's refreshing not to be partisan. So I, that was hopeful, too, that this this could be these kind of relationships are still possible. And even, you, you know, in, in religion reporting, because we report on so many people's different beliefs. You, we have, there's this idea that you don't have to win in the conversation. Most people, mm -hmm. when we talk about God or politics, you want to win. Well, as a reporter yeah. of a religion, I'm not trying to convince you that your belief is good or bad. I'm just trying to understand it. And the act of listening and understanding opens up all this possibility that folks are more than you thought they were. Yeah, And that's we see this all the time, that I, I don't understand people but they're different. They're more than the sum of their worst deeds. They're more than the sum of their beliefs. They're, they are human beings trying to figure out how to make their way in this world. And if the one thing we try to model in our reporting is to help people see, oh, okay, here's someone I didn't think I liked, but I might like them. And that's okay. And there's a real pushback now uh, in, to say, no, 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 human empathy, human friendship is bad because mm -hmm. of a social goal and that's not the choice that we've made here at RNS. you know we're, we point out when people do wrong do the right but we're not in the decision to say no that we can't listen to you or that some some other goal supersedes the basic uh, kindness and uh, humanity that we all share yeah um it's valuable work and i've uh, and the Dispatch Faith Newsletter linked to um, reporting you guys have done um, quite a bit, um, and we'll continue to do that, but it's important work. Um, thanks for taking the time, Bob, to help us understand some of these issues better, help us understand what you do better. I appreciate it. It was great. Great to be here. Thank you so much.